Doctors, I'm Ralph Newell, your host this week. I have with me Dr. Philomena Mantella, president of Grand Valley State University. You know, before we get into to the boring stuff we're going to talk about, I, I just want to take an opportunity here to get to know you a little bit of outside the ivory towers. So we have a few questions to help in, enlighten our audience about you. So, so, so I can avoid this topic later in the interview. What is the one question you wish people would not ask you or ask you less? <laughs> well, I'm the first female president at Grand Valley, so I usually get that question. So that asking less, I'm a leader in the university. I have my own style. I would love if that would get asked just a few times less. <laughs> okay, okay. I can understand that one. Where did you grow up? I grew up in upstate New York in a small town, um, really uh, south of Syracuse, New York. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. No Spent there. most of my time in metro areas after leaving there. Went to Syracuse to school, but then um, spent most of my time right outside New York City or right outside Boston, um, and a little bit of time in Michigan early in my career. Okay, so what do you think about Jim Beheim retiring? <laughs> uh, I think it's about time. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. He was there when I was there, so that exactly. tells you how long he's thinking. been there. Yeah. No, he's. He's he uh, I don't know embodies Syracuse is Syracuse you know in in a lot of ways so I sp yeah. I spent a lot of little time in Foxborough Massachusetts that was outside of Boston so I was mm -hmm. more struck by when Tom Brady re re uh, retired this year than than Jim oh. Bay. Okay, okay, that was a tough one. Yeah, definitely he will be missed. Um, all right, now uh, when it comes to movies, what movie do you stop and watch as if you've never seen it before? Oh, wow. What a great question. Um, it's usually Moonstruck. Mm, okay. Yeah. A lot of, lot, of, lot of my Italian heritage comes through that, that movie. So it's fun to watch, to, uh, they, particularly as some of my, you know, my, obviously my grandparents and my dad has passed on. So some of those traditions, I just have to stop and, and look at it. Okay. I mean, gosh, you were just talking about, you know, your granddad. So it makes me think about your childhood then. Um, so what's the most ridiculous thing you believed as a child? Well, you know, I, I, I picked out uh, a couple of careers in my life, teaching, nursing, and um, social work. And when I think back on it now, you know, I miss the broad range of opportunity because I came up pretty traditionally to those were fields women were in uh, mm. when I was when I was going through school. So in some ways, that was the most ridiculous thing I thought is that I was bound to a finite set of career options. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. And um, anecdotally, you know, I thought that, too, in some ways with something yeah. that I would be allowed to do or could do growing yeah. up, um, you know. I think that's one of the, you know, the the opportunities we have with diverse students or students that have been underserved or underrepresented in higher education mm -hmm. is to give them that sense of possible self that perhaps they haven't um, contemplated before because we all put some sort of bounds around um, what we're considering and it's just pushing those boundaries, I think, can be enormously helpful to empowering students. Absolutely, absolutely. Two more questions and we'll, we'll, we'll get moving. What is your guilty pleasure? Uh, wow, I probably have more than one of those. I would say a bourbon old fashioned. Oh, stop. Coffee. Yes. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, love it, love it. Okay, all right, well, we'll stay, uh, last question, we'll, we'll stay uh, in, in that realm of, of spirits, um, if you will. But <laughs> I, I was literally right before, um, and I just, just thought of this question, honestly, um, right before I um, logged in to, to talk with you, um, I got some pop-up saying, today is National Beer Day um, from some brewery down the street here. But anyway, so uh, just thinking about that, do you have a favorite beer? Uh, Molson Canadian. Oh, okay. So my dad worked for Molson Canadian for many really? years. And um, so that was on, believe it or not, on tap at my house uh, at, at pretty much all times. 
Oh, wow, wow. wow. <laughs> I like this podcast so far. This is fun. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And, and yeah. honestly, um, you know, I, I try to just do things differently or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't, um, and just preparing, there wasn't a lot of things that I saw about you. I said, okay, let's get to go to her a little more um, outside here. So anyway, so no, I, I appreciate you indulging me, if you will. So absolutely. Uh, but, you know, seriously, uh, just, you know, to get into what we're going to talk about here, um, Dr. Mantella, uh, Grand Valley State is in the first cohort of institutions to be granted, I think, you know, the coveted do it certification. And for those that started the process, um, we only certified literally one, less than 1% of the respondents. So um, this is not an everybody gets a trophy program. You all definitely talk to talk and, and walk to walk. So um, congratulations to you, your staff, the students. You know, I think um, in all those, you know, in the community, the legislature, et cetera, that have, have supported what you guys are doing. Just want to know, what did you think when you found out that you guys were being recognized? Uh, we were super excited. You know, it was a it was a very uh, serious and rigorous self assessment, self appraisal process, mm -hmm. which we enjoy. We have a real culture of assessment, a culture of evaluation. Um, always looking to do better. Always looking for understanding, and so we enjoyed the process. So I should say that as well, because it helped us with our own reflections, but then also to learn that we were um, acknowledged in this first group of this first very small and elite group was really um, something we're really proud of. And I, I do want to extend my um, thanks and appreciation to the folks that lead the work each and every day, which really starts with Jesse Burnell. Dr. Burnell is mm -hmm. our vice president for inclusion and equity. Um, he he spearheaded the process. Yesterday, we did um, something called a Laker Talk, which we have started this year, which is like, um, we'll stay with spirits for a moment. You know, it's like on a Thursday, um, kind of a happy hour. We asked one of the vice presidents to share their journey in a personal way, sort of in some ways, the kinds of questions you were sharing with me. Be sure that people see each other as individuals, just not roles we play. And Jesse's talk was on the, his journey, eight years, two presidents um, uh, in terms of leadership and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and this theme of continuity and change, because we've had both, you know, different approaches. And so what a great opportunity to reflect back um, in a, and I would bet much of what was top of his mind came out of the, a, a process like this, where you think about those changes and the each impact, and then it informs the next stage. So sorry for the long answer, but we were Hello. super excited to uh, to participate, grateful to be acknowledged. Yeah, and, and, and you definitely hit on something. It is, um, you know, I think, like I said, we started with 300 some plus schools. Um, and then, you know, some didn't complete the, first level of evaluation, but, you know, I think we lost a good chunk when they really had to do that work to go back and do that self-evaluation and provide that information. And then, you know, that information was, you know, scrutinized by a third party independent to us and the researchers who validated what you did. So, um, um, so yeah, again, you know, congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. And, you know, I don't want to, um, for the audience here, delve too much into the write-up that we did in Diverse. It was in our February 16th edition um, of this year. So I definitely encourage you to go online to read about it and to learn more about, you know, some of the things that, you know, were the pluses at Grand Valley that, you know, helped them get this recognition. Um, but when I was reading that article again the other day, um, one of the things that stuck out the most to me was a quote from uh, one of your professors. Um, and I hope I say her name, her name right, Dr. Uh, Chastity Bailey Fakori, um, who said, um, it's important to have a president who sets the tone for the work. Um, and yeah, that just totally simplified for me. I think I've said that to people all along in this journey for me of working and um, looking at diversity in higher ed for 30 years that, you know, that it starts at the top. Um, mm -hmm. And for those that um, aren't aware, we'll just quickly go over them. 
the do it certification looks at four core pillars and number one is institutional leadership and commitment and so i think um what you said earlier about dr bernal um uh, you know going through the archives and looking we have talked with him and he's been quoted a number of times over the years for some of the work that he's doing uh, including yourself um the second one was institutional curricular and co-curricular accountability the third being institutional climate and the fourth being institutional representation and composition and so you know when i you dig deeper in those and you look at the areas that are looked at uh, in there you guys um you know definitely embodied um, all four pillars um, so somewhere in here is a question. <laughs> so you know, in the aftermath of the George Floyd incident, um, you issued a 15 point charge for racial equity. And again, when I look at that and look at all those points, um, every last one of them fell as a component under one of those four pillars. So can you talk about a few of those pillars that you guys implemented um, that were the most difficult so far for you guys to achieve or get off the ground? Yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do is call on a bro our broadest university community and not call them in spirit, but call them in action. So you pointed to the 15 point plan. We wanted to be quite specific about what we wanted to achieve in the areas we felt work could be done. And Jesse mounted a, a network and we called them that because they came out of every level mm -hmm. of the institution. It wasn't something that was kind of bureaucratically structured or organized. Networks of support, we wanted to know where people's passion were. We wanted to involve people that have longstanding been engaged in the work and we wanted to bring newcomers to the table. And we worked through those 15 point plans. My honest answer to you as president is, is setting the priorities was the hardest part because we we had finite time, more than finite resources is finite time, you know, um, to really accomplish all the shifts. And I kept, every time I meet with a network of advisors, I would say, help me understand where we can begin, where you need the senior leadership to begin, where grassroots activity could move forward. And can we begin to level that work and chunk that work so that we're moving on multiple fronts, but it's not, it's not so diffuse that we can't measure it, we can't understand it, you know, um, we can't lift it in our institutional ethos. And so that was without a doubt the hardest uh, part of the work. And, um, you know, some things did lift forward. Um, one was moving from advisors to accountability. And you mentioned that word in, I think it was your pillar too. Um, and it was really important as we, and this started with the evolution of the structure that Jesse has led, which is at a senior uh, level, it's on, uh, he's, both the vice president for diversity, equity, inclusion, and the chief of staff uh, to the president. So very senior level position. But when I joined the institution, um, and I'm sure you've seen this happen before, where when there is a free standalone um, organization, people either defer or mm -hmm. shift work there, or it, sometimes it even gets competitive for resources and and things of that nature. So we wanted to evolve that structure into a hybrid where Jesse would set the tone, set the goals, set the alignment with the strategic plan, um, be sure that the senior team was intentional about their work and created accountability structures within, you know, he cannot specifically be sure our faculty hiring is diverse. He can monitor it. But the provost has to feel accountable for that. Our vice president enrollment has to feel accountable for the educational equity gaps we have in retention or completion rates. So structurally, we have leadership. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I'm so happy with the leadership we had here. We had institutional energy, but prioritizing and structuring it so that people stepped into the work and understood their responsibility was not one of um, rhetoric, it was one of action, it was the most challenging part of you know the plan because the 15 turned into a hundred different elements you know under the 15 and right. 
that was the work. Okay, okay. Um, also about that same time, I hope I'm saying this acronym right, I'm not exactly sure what it stands for, but uh, in 2020, you started the REP4, I don't know, that's that REP4? Uh, REP4, yeah. REP4, okay. Um, so please tell us about that and let our listeners know how they can get involved and learn more about it. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to, because we're at this moment now where we're thinking about how to scale REP4 because we think it has great promise. So, um, you know, we start, I made this comment earlier in my introduction uh, that, that students need a sense of possible self. So we, um, when I came to the university, I had the good fortune of spending the last 10 years in what I would call an educational startup within an institution. I was at Northeastern University. I led a separate instance of the university where educational innovation could be done. And I had a fabulous network of folks that I'd met through the years um, that I wanted to expose to Grand Valley and for Grand Valley to really understand from them. So Rep4 grew out of a, really a convening on the future of education. And in that convening, and this won't surprise you if you've been in education for some time, we had, you know, we had Google's educational evangelist, we had Sony's head of um, head of uh, education and training, we had the president of the Kellogg Foundation, we had strong leaders, we had some of the best innovators from the region nationally. But the most compelling voices in that room were the student voices. And um, we had high school students, and we had college students. And this was about educational equity. It was about the future. It was about the individuals we're leaving behind or were poorly serving. And so um, we left that room saying, we are gonna be focused on action, which is a theme of mine. Um, we are going to work in the interest of the public and not work so that we find some wonderful thing that we wanna hubbard and keep close and not share because there's too many people to be served. We want learners to be at the center uh, and we want to, um, not do this for our communities, but do this with our communities who are um, really living the experiences that we're seeking to really address. So we did a proof of concept. Rep4 has four components. It is a learner summit. It is um, a set of institutions that agree to take these learner inspired ideas into educational reform. It is a national convening where we expose, you know, anybody that wants to see the work. And it's a platform where we're keeping track of our journey of elevating student voice. And so Rep4 in its simplest concept is an alliance of institutions that are intentionally diverse, that we, we have uh, HBCUs, we have a community college, we have a research institution, we have regional, we have a system. We're intentionally diverse. And we're doing work to move educational equity and move learners to a higher level of student success. And we're using their gifts, and that's what I call them, their gifts of the things we need to work on as part of our educational reform. Um, so that movement, we've got seven institutions. We represent 200,000 learners, and we are connected to community agencies and high schools in its fourth year. And we are now at the point where we have to consider how we're going to scale. Are we going to invite others? Um, are we going to produce the toolkits and what we've learned? Um, mm -hmm. So we're exploring those really big questions. So the what I would say to your listeners is if you're interested and inspired by the work, just reach out to me and um, we'll, we'll we'll talk about the opportunities that are there. There's others in this work. So it might be networks that are helping others build, like what can diverse and higher education help us do? And what can we help you do to elevate or excellencia or whatever? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we work with them too. So yes, yeah. no, definitely. Um, we should have some conversations um, offline about it. I just happened to just catch that. I don't even know where. Somewhere I was reading. I was like, oh, this is interesting. Yeah. Um, which which kind of, you know, leads me to my, my next question then. Um, wh why are you so passionate about first-gen students and those from the underserved communities? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, um, first of all, I, I do believe it's what education's about. I get really frustrated when I hear people say things like we don't have enough talent mm -hmm. because we are leaving so many people out of the knowledge economy or allowing um, their educational pathways by not relating to other educational pathways more seamlessly kind of create these ceilings. So one, I think it's the... Um, it is the mission of education. The social mobility mission uh, is very core to me. I too am a first gen student. You know, my dad that I referenced early on, who ended up as um, a vice president for marketing for Molson uh, Brewery in Canada, he had an eighth grade education, wow. had many failures uh, along the way, um, so resilient, such a um, experiential learner. And what we see is we see that promise in individuals of all backgrounds, mm -hmm. but we understand that those the structures of systemic inequity are really um, inhibiting the equality of opportunity. Um, and so it's kind of where I live. It was my own experience in some ways. It's where I get the most joy. No, I, I agree with you. I can definitely see that. You know, currently, as you know, you know, there's a major attack on DEI, DEI and, you know, you're no stranger to that. Um, you've been <laughs> around long enough to see that they see some of these attacks come full circle. You know, I just think back, you know, was it 20, 30 years ago, you know, everything was anti-affirmative action. Now it's DEI, but it's the same stuff. Um, and when I was, um, you know, Googling you on, on our site, I saw that we covered, we covered you back in 2007 in diverse, um, when you were at New Northeastern mm -hmm. and I'm sure you recall, um, the thing that we were covering then was the Ujima scholars, mm -hmm. um, program that you guys had, which offered scholarships to African-American students to help boost enrollment. But eventually you guys had to open it up to white students to avoid becoming a target of anti-affirmative action. Um, lawsuits. So what lessons can you take from that experience and advise your colleagues on today, you know, since, you know, some of this stuff is under serious attack again? Yeah, I mean, and some of the laws, the, even the laws in the state of Michigan around what you can do with admissions and what you can do with scholarship aid um, provide constraints that we have to, we have to honor, we have to be aware of, we have to work to to move, I, I think if they're if they're not um, serving our public interest and uh, our people equally, and so um, you know, so one thing is um, say you know it, it's I, I'm probably a lot of people start with a sentence which is stay true to your values. Mm -hmm. If in fact um, we have we know students have equal promise and we know the outcomes are different and we know the system serves them differently, then you can't apply, you know, uh, a similar strategy, which is kind of where the, the DEI attacks come from in my mind is that somehow by doing X, we're removing the opportunity to do Y for a, a majority population. And so I think that um, staying true to our values just last week, you know, we pretty well raked through the coals in the conservative media around uh, commencement celebrations that yes. we do based on, you know, students' connections with our affinity centers or their identity. And again, we press through, I press through, I press through with conversations with the foundation, the community, the board, um, any conversation I need to have to have people stop, understand that, the, that it is wrong to politicize these issues and why it's happening, you know, um, and just kind of, you know, try to stay in the center lane within the guideposts of the law um, and try to uh, be a person that's willing to speak out uh, and speak clearly and both by my, by virtue of the fact that I'm in a public institution, you know, I can't take a political stance on one side or the other. So trying to keep out of things becoming political stances um, is is really what I try to do. Gosh, you, you kind of said something that I don't say struck a nerve, but at least um, got me thinking, you know, I, mean, I just saw a report uh, here recently, uh, I think it was earlier this week. 
um, and, and I forget who did it. It may have been inside higher ed, but um, you know, they had reached out to all the public college presidents in Florida um, for comment about, you know, what was going on in their state. And what shocked me was all 40 declined to, to make a statement, um, even anonymously. Um, you know, what do you think about that? What does that say? I think it's sad. I think it's, um, I, I'm sure it's the reality of the conditions there that there is real risk mm -hmm. um, given the politics for them. And I think you're evaluating whether to be silent and to work for change or to be vocal and maybe not have the opportunity to work for change. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're all in different personal conditions. So, you know, um, I think that the other part of that evaluation, which I many times have to do when, um, you know, do I respond to something that began with a tweet with zero fact checking mm -hmm. directly to that, you know, that space and to voices that are likely not to listen. So uh, you're also measuring whether the response can, in fact, be affected action. So I would love to see people might be more verbal and vocal about this, but I think there is real evaluation about, you know, what's the what's the likely impact, uh, both of your voice being heard um, and uh, the likely impact that you can continue to lead for change. Um, so it's it, it's very difficult. You know, I hate to comment because I'm not in that right. shoes. I know how I lead. I know how free I feel um, with my opinions, but it's 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 a very personal journey at some level. Uh, you know, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and you know, without getting into you know naming names or details, you know, I definitely have talked to some people recently who, in regards to that same issue, and they're not in Florida, but different states who, um, I think to your point, um, had to look at this stuff personally, <laughs> you know, hey, I'm, I'm close to retirement, <laughs> you know, I, yeah. you know, I, I, I can't rock the boat and, and, and lose all that. So I understand it. And I get it too. Um, and I like how you said, you know, are you going to be loud and put out or can you do it behind the scenes? So, um, <clears throat> so when you, when you think about it like that, um, who, who do you think, um, can, can help us out, help you guys out that, you know, the higher education leaders, you know, who are the allies that are sort of outside of, you know, the legislature, if you will, that, um, you think could, yeah. could I mean, the first, the first thing I would say is business and industry, you know, um, I think they carry great weight. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I co-authored with uh, the president of Excellencia a uh, op-ed we're hoping will someone will pick up about um, the fact that if you just look at the mere um, number of students, Latino students who are in um, our public universities, and close the equity back gap. I think the number is, I hope I get it right, was we would put 2 million more people into the workforce and we would diversify the workforce. So I think we can make an argument because people have, businesses have severe talent gaps. Mm -hmm. They're looking for us to be creative and clear where we can solve our problems as a, uh, as a country uh, and as for their, for their own business futures. And so I continue to place the diversity argument, if you will, or the DEI argument in the uh, equation for addressing talent. And I have found that our businesses are very responsive to that. Yeah, no, it, it's, um, I, I echo that like 100%. Um, I literally just had that conversation um, earlier this week and I was telling someone, you know, anecdotally about it was about 20 years ago that I was at a conference board conference for Fortune 500 companies who were trying to connect with higher ed. And some of the things that they were doing was they were putting a lot of scholarship money into getting, you know, diverse students uh, into the pipeline. And um, the other thing was singling out institutions that they felt were not preparing students for a diverse workforce yeah. um, and and not literally recruiting there. Um and they literally called out a few institutions who, you know, have since made made changes. 
So I, I agree with you a hundred percent that it, it will take, um, yeah. you know, corporate America, you know, speak, speaking up. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you two quick examples of, um, you know, uh, if you think of the problem we have with gaps uh, in um, the nursing workforce, you know, mm, yes. real serious national issue. Um, we had worked with Corwell Health, who is our largest employer in Michigan, believe it or not. It's it's um, it is a health, a very large health system across the, the state. Um, and we approached them and they approached us. They said, how many more nursing students can you produce? We're really in pain and your graduates are wonderful. And um, we, we examined the, what, what the current condition is. And what the current condition is, is that there's traveling nurses. So they were up, you know, they're paying premiums um, and maybe not such equitable premiums because the people who are in the workforce permanently striving every day are getting less than perhaps a traveling nurse to fill a gap, right? So there's that, there was bonusing, but that was all within the confines of the existing workforce. So we said, hey, why don't we do this? You resource, help us resource to get faculty to be able, because nursing is very structured. You know, you have to have a, a, a certain ratio of faculty to students. You have to have a certain amount of, of, of resource that's supporting them. You help us resource that for the first five years, and we'll make a commitment to sustain it in perpetuity as long as we need nurses. Gave me the time, right? Because it's tough when you're trying to think about faculty lines and you know, in tenure and the kinds of things. It gave me five years to really address what the change that was needed. Right. Then, so half of that money went in infrastructure, half of it went to scholarship. So we've been able to draw a more diverse nursing pipeline because we've been able to take the two co the cost of the nursing years down to zero. So um, by the sponsorship of the organization in which they will have a guaranteed job and they make a commitment for two years post-graduation. And I have another program like that. And in each case, it diversifies the pipeline uh, mm -hmm. rather than just addresses the finite condition of competing for what exists. And so I think we can do a lot more there. And the more we tell that story and the more people see um, the, the benefit and value of that diverse pipeline, uh, the more we'll, um, I think we'll get a, a larger lobby. Right. You know, in that pipeline, I mean, that is, um, I think what you guys were trying to achieve in other schools, when I say um, trying to achieve, it's like back when you were at Northeastern, the Ujima scholarships. Right. Um, it's, I mean, you guys had it there. Everybody else has had other similar programs, um, to, you know, to, to open up that pipeline. And, you know, go back to your time there when you guys had to be preemptive, if you will, to avoid a lawsuit of opening it up to, to um, you know, to, to white students. And now looking at things that, you know, there are some colleagues out there of mine in higher ed that are doing preemptive things, if you will, um, now. In, in light of, of, of the attacks on, on DEI. And so I'm just wondering, are you guys doing anything? Or are you hearing about other things that um, other institutions may be doing voluntarily um, to sort of, I'll say, water down this commitment to DEI in light of, you know, what they think may be coming down the road? You know, what, what, I, what I hope we did when I was at Northeastern, um, which as we... Um, welcome students from other background diversity was still very much our focus and so we looked for students who had spent time in the work of diversity um, were interested in social justice topics and missions so whereas um, the program was technically opened mm -hmm. the the mission of the program to inspire uh, diverse communities and have a uh, reverberating impact um, what was maintained. And so I would hope, I don't have examples to draw from to say these are changes. I think those happen. Um, if they're happening, they probably happen quite quietly at institutions. Um, and, uh, but I would hope that, you know, we sort of stay on mission, which it includes you know, equity and social justice and supporting 
the learners that have an inspiration and promise and appetite for education. Right, right. I mean, you're, you're fortunate. I mean, I'll be honest. I, I would say to be um, at a public institution in a non-red state, you know, I guess maybe I could say Michigan is, is purplish, <laughs> you know, kind of like that. But okay. even still, you know, you guys have had um, things in the legislature the past few years, um, I think many of which appear to have failed or died or still making their way through um, in regards to anti-DEI stuff. At the institutional level, I'm talking about the public institutions there. Um, is there anything that you all have done to help fight those bills or have, you know, people kind of been silent, if you will? I mean, just wonder. I, I think, you know, I, can, I can't speak for the other institutions specifically, but I think, you know, and Michigan's organized, we're not a public system, we're organized uh, independently okay. um, with different boards. And so we don't come together as, we, we come together as an association and um, uh, twice a year, but um, I would say for myself, we continue to work with electeds. We continue to, you know, build the business interest around diversity. Uh, we continue to, and you saw it, I'm sure, in all our evaluation, we have three commitments as an institution, an empowered educational experience and appreciation um, and um, an appetite for lifelong learning and a culture of educational equity. We don't shy away from those three commitments. They're always when we're when we're telling our story, we tell those stories. Um, we don't make one story quieter and another story louder. The the beauty of three commitments that are simple. We ask everyone at the university to contribute to it. And when I go out to talk with our electeds or to, um, you know, work with our business leaders, you know, I lead with those commitments. So it, educational equity is always there. And I would say, again, I have personally had a lot of really thoughtful questions, mm -hmm. thoughtful debate, but we have worked in uh, our way to a, to a very um, sort of comfortable space. Um, and I don't feel that we're, we're sort of ratcheting back um, our work on DEI. Okay, no, good. I mean, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, you know, sort of, you know, um, along the same lines, you know, you have the attack on DEI and then you have the same, I think, I think sometimes they're roped in together and, and sometimes they're on separate, they're on separate tracks here. And I'm talking about um, the CRT, the critical race theory uh, thing in, you know, especially in K-12, you know, through higher ed. So last count I saw, there were um, seven states that have banned CRT. I think there were 28 states that had, an, including the District of Columbia, that had no restrictions and 16, including Michigan, um, that have legislation in process. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know where it stands in Michigan and what, if anything, in higher ed, um, I mean, and what, what, if anything, are you guys doing about it? Because one of the core pillars, you know, for do it is looking at the curriculum and having that type of those types of courses and things like that. And you guys, you know, obviously had it. So yeah. uh, have it rather. Um, yeah. So what, what do you have to say there? I, I, I would say, you know, um, we've got a second term governor, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, we have, um, for the first time, and I think like 40 something years, we have, um, both the governor's party and the, the, the legislative, um, majority, uh, aligned. So I will honestly tell you, there may be proposals out there. They have not elevated to one where, when I sit with electives and because we've come out of an election, I've done that pretty regularly every week, um, the issue really hasn't been front and center here in Michigan right now. Uh, you're definitely fortunate. <laughs> yeah. right. um, okay. Well, like I said, we, you know, we, we're getting um, close here to the end. Um, one question for you. Um, what is the one story about Grand Valley that you would love to tell, but you rarely ever get a chance to? You have great questions. I have to remember that one. 
Okay. You know, I think Grand Valley has, uh, I would I would call it the, the success of change at Grand Valley. That's the story. Uh, it's, we're 63, 64 years old. Mm -hmm. The institution has evolved, starting with uh, liberal arts only, into uh, a wide range of professional education. It serves every county in Michigan. We are an increasingly diverse community. We have redone our college structures through the years. We have opened locations, started in Allendale, and now we are have as many students in Grand Rapids. So we have an urban and a suburban location. And all of those changes have had positive results. And I take zero credit for them because they were my predecessors. But the agility an institution gets from changing and seeing changes, something that can yield positive results, makes them more able to consider and to move in uh, tumultuous times. So for me, the basic structure and history and um, agility of the institution makes it an incredibly special place. And then the opportunity to serve um, students at a price point, you know, our in-state rate is about $14,000 in tuition, very different from my former institution. You know, so just the opportunity to really reach and support fully is much greater. So agility and access are the two stories that I would tell. Awesome. It, it, it's great. And I'm just, um, I wasn't even going to ask you this, but you just reminded me of some of the stuff that I was reading when you talk about reaching every county. And I was very impressed with, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, how, how I'm looking at this, but you have some programs where if you were a veteran in Michigan that you could go to Grand Valley, I don't know, at a reduced rate or for free, if you know, and that you were attracting students that uh, I'm saying maybe had credits at other institutions, but hadn't finished their programs um, and things like that. I was very impressed that you seem to be um, trying to, like you say, serve the entire state. And so what um, what's the impetus for that? Why, why are you guys um, doing that? That's our mission. I mean, it's that simple. That's our mission. Um, okay. And so when when we have institutional debates about those programs, like is it wise, the veterans will use that as an example. Uh, the, the veterans promise is mm -hmm. really if a student elects to serve that they have an admissions spot when they come to Grand Valley, when they return, you know, and our veterans, when they're four years in service, when they have to come back and find their guidance counselor and their transcripts and all of that. So as they leave, we set that 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 place for them. Um, most veterans return to their home state. Most most of the criteria to serve in the military it requires that you have um, you know not been had any uh, probationary or dismissals at your high school. That you know there is criteria for service that is very aligned with the spirit of finding students with promise. And yet we set up these artificial barriers. So what do veterans do? They go to the easy access institutions um, and maybe don't, don't look with a range of choice. We are looking in every subpopulation for the barriers. And we're trying to really identify those barriers and address them. And when you do that, you've got to dispute myths, right? In each right, of these right. cases, like, oh, you know, what, what does this mean? What does it mean to average grade point? What does it mean to entry criteria? What does it mean, et cetera, et cetera? Or even working with our eighth grade pathway students to, um, to give them handholds through high school and support for them and their families and criteria they need to meet every year, but it's not the same admissions process. They are admitted and they have criteria to fulfill in order to maintain that admission. So we just have to address each each item to serve our mission. We This notion that we, we set up one structure, mm -hmm. everybody starts in the fall and everybody goes through a term and everybody's evaluated the same way and everybody goes through in, with an unbroken rhythm is just, it's false. It's right. false. Right, right. No, so, no. Thank you for e explaining that. Um, it, um, like I, said, I was impressed by. It. I was like, okay, wow, this this is good. But you know, um, we couldn't talk about everything, so you just kind of was in an opportunity. Yeah. But hey, you know, um, thank you so much for your time. I am um, again 
congratulations to Grand Valley um, for, you know, being one of the first schools to get to do it certification. Um, you know, we will be recognizing you guys next week um, at the Natahee Conference. Um, I don't know if you're going to be in town, um, if you're going to be at the ACE Conference or... Um, <laughs> which is actually meeting like right, right, right down the road here. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, you know, congratulations to you. And we'll definitely, um, you know, pump you guys up, if you will. Um, Thank at, you. At um, and, you know, on a personal note, my neighbors, you know, sort of here since the pandemic, you know, we always get together now, like for happy hours on Fridays and things like that. It was something that the fruit that bore from everybody, you know, sitting here at home, you know, it actually made us a, a better community here. But um, uh, tonight's happy hour, I said I was going to bring some beer. So I, uh, I usually I bring IPAs, but I'm, I'm going to go get some Molson today. All right. And, <laughs> Thank and, you. And, and, and in honor of you and, and bring that to the group. So I appreciate uh, it. Yeah, no, and I appreciate you, you, you know, uh, being open and sharing that with us. And again, congratulations. And we say thank you to you, Dr. Mantel. Thank you so much.